With that being said, scripture reading for this morning is found in the book of Matthew, chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. If you want to turn there, well, uh, if you're using one of the Bibles in the pews, it can be found on page 976. Matthew, chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. The word of the Lord says this. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again at the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the 11th hour came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, friend, am I not being unfair to you? Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we read through this passage today, may we be challenged by your Holy Spirit. As we approach your throne, may we do it humbly. As we gather for worship today, may we have our hearts opened to you. As we hear the words of your scripture, may we be pierced to our souls. As we fellowship one another with one another, may we sharpen one another. God, may our lives reflect your will for them. May our hearts reflect your love and your your, your graciousness. God, we didn't ask for the gift of your son, Jesus. You gave him to us freely before we even knew what we needed. So God, may 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 we be made truly grateful before you today. And Father, we do thank you for this... Sometimes it's the simple things that bring us joy. So we do thank you for the break in the heat. We thank you for a couple 70-degree days in the middle of the 80s and 90s. We thank you for a church and a congregation where we can gather together and we can worship openly and freely. We can proclaim your name. But God, may we not just proclaim your name within these walls. May we live your name as we leave this building. May we be built up and strengthened while we're here as one is when they work out in a gym. But may we take that and go forth as we leave this place as well. And God, we simply want your will to be done in our lives. And wherever your will leads us is where we desire to truly be. And maybe that leads us to easy places. Maybe that leads us to difficult places. Wherever it is, we want you to be glorified. So work within us to that end. That we may live and proclaim your name. That when others see us, they may see you. And the name of Jesus may be exalted, not just in this church, but in the nations. God, you love us and care for us. Help us to expand and take that message to our communities, to our families, but also to the world. For your honor and glory and for your kingdom purposes, we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. I don't know about you, but I sure am enjoying the weather yesterday and today. And I'm going to enjoy it as much as I possibly can because it's going to be a long time, I think, before we see it again. Not not so much the wind, but the weather itself. Um, It's been five years since my family went on a vacation to Disney World. And you've heard me talk about a little bit this, a little bit about this in sermon illustrations before. But it was the first time in my life I've ever been to an amusement park and was introduced to this concept of a fast pass or a rapid pass, as they call it. Um, before then, 
well, mostly I grew up in Lancaster, so I went to Hershey Park most summers, and even since we moved up here, our families have gotten, gotten, my kids have gone to Hershey Park almost every summer, and I never heard of this thing called a fast pass. If you don't know what a fast pass is, basically, before, what Disney says is, our theme parks are so jam-packed with people that you're going to be able to ride so few of our rides during a day, that we're going to give you three fast passes a day, which means we have a regular line for people, and then we have a fast pass line for people, and you can sign up for a specific time in 15-minute increments throughout the day to get your fast pass for this ride. So instead of waiting four hours for a ride, you can only wait 15 minutes. It's a pretty good deal. You just have to have your day mapped out and planned out because you have to submit your fast passes literally months in advance because there's only so many fast passes for so, many, so much time. And if you don't get in in time, you don't get a fast pass. And four hours may be a bit of extreme exaggeration to wait, but it's usually at least an hour or two. And it can be up to four or five at different spots at Disney. So we had our fast passes mapped down. But then a couple of really good things happened. Maybe not so much physically to my family and my extended family, but for our vacation, they turned out really good. See, my mom had knee surgery about two to three weeks before we went down. Because that, she couldn't walk around Disney. She had to be on one of those scooters, which she had to rent. Here's the cool thing that Disney does. They say, when part of your family has this ailment, if you will, then the whole family gets to benefit from it. So when we unload and load up shuttles, the people that are the first off and the first on are the ones on the scooters. My mom was the one on the scooter, so she's one of the first people on the shuttle every time. All of your family may go along with her as well. So all 11 of us pile in on my mom's scooter because that's what Disney wanted us to do. This is their policy, not mine. And if you don't fit on that next shuttle, guess what? You're waiting for the next shuttle, which could be 10 minutes or it could be an hour. We don't know. Then, this is going to sound terrible, and you've heard me say this before probably, my niece, Rowan, <laughs> Sounds terrible that I say it's good. She had a bacterial infection in her brain that is gone now, so that's why it's good, okay? Um, but, but at the time, for, for a year or two, she struggled with this. I forget what it was called exactly. It was something I never heard of before. What's that? Pandas is what it's called. And it basically gave her very much autistic qualities in her life where she would get stuck up on certain things and certain things set her off that never did before. One of the things that set her off medically diagnosed from the doctor was waiting in lines. <laughs> this is not me speaking. So my sister and brother-in-law took her medical diagnosis, signed by the doctor, down to Disney with us. And the first night we went to guest services, said, here's what she has. Is there anything we can do? Absolutely. We do not want her waiting in line. We don't want her to be set off. So if she wants to go on a ride... If you're already fast pass for it, just get in the fast pass line. But any other ride, go give your name to the first person in line, and they will either get you in the fast pass line or tell you a time where you can come back and get in the fast pass line. And by the way, you're all a family, so you're all linked together, so you guys all get to go with her as well. Our vacation, we will never have as good a vacation at Disney ever again under any circumstances as we did there because we didn't have to wait in lines. It, it, here, here's where I knew we were spoiled. We had fast pass Space Mountain ahead of time. We got in the fast pass line, we get in, and from where we were in the fast pass line, it was about a 30 minute wait to get on the ride. And my kids were like, oh, we gotta wait 30 minutes to get on the line. When we would walk past a bunch of people who were standing in the regular line, right, we'd already skipped past them, the person beside us in the regular line said, we've already been in line for an hour and a half. And the fast pass line moves about two to three times faster than the regular line. So they had another hour, and they went an hour and a half to go in this fast pass line to get there. That's when I knew that they were spoiled, okay? Since then, other amusement parks seem to have picked up on this trend. Because if you go to other amusement parks, you can now purchase fast passes, right? See, I like the concept and the idea of a fast pass when it works in my favor, but I don't necessarily like the idea of the concept of a fast pass when I'm the one standing in the regular line and everybody else is walking right onto something. I would love to purchase a fast pass for my family, but I can't. The reason I can't is because I am way too cheap. All right? Most of you are too. Here's what I mean. I went on some websites and did some research this week. A fast pass for Hershey Park. You ready for this? Um, is anywhere from $65 to $200 per day, depending on the date. A fast pass at Six Flags, New Jersey, is as low as $90 per day. 
And at Cedar Point, they start at $114 per day. That's per person, not per family. If you do the math, the cost of your fast pass is one and a half to three times the price of admission to the park. I'm way too cheap. I'm just not going to do it, right? But I like the idea when it comes my way, as it did in Disney years ago. The concept with the fast pass, the way most parks have it set up, is that the rich get richer. If I can afford, say we're going, to, we're going to Cedar Point in about a month, month and a half with the family. If I could afford to do an extra $600 to $650 a day for my family of five, we could all get fast passes. That's the rich getting richer. The problem is we can't do that because I'm not choosing to spend six to $650 in that manner. Right? That's the exact opposite of what we find in our passage today, though. In our passage today, the rich don't get richer, the poor get richer. Jesus Christ said, the last will be first, and the first will be last. And we all agree with this, right? Until we don't. It's a great idea if you're in the fast pass line, but not so much if you're in the regular line. I mean, I, there, there's this saying, you've heard it before, the early bird gets the worm. And the older I get, the more I tend to believe that. The more, or I should say, the more I tend to live my life that way. I am, I am becoming, like, if you had told me even 10 years ago, when I moved up here, that I would be the morning person that I am today, I've always been a morning person. But morning person is getting more extreme. I don't think, I think it's just Dan Force challenges me. Like, I want to try and wake up earlier than him or something. But on an average morning, I wake up at 4.22 in the morning. That's what I set my alarm for. And you've, you've heard me say this before. Why 422? Because I got this weird thing about double numbers on my clock. If it's not 422, it's 411. But whatever. I guess you really had to try effective if it's like 333 or 444. But whatever. Right? Early bird gets the worm. Because I believe, and if I see it, you know, I, books I've read, things I've seen, when I try and mimic the habits of successful people, most successful people don't sleep in. Most successful people get up and attack the day. And I believe that's a good theory and a good philosophy to live by. Therefore, I try and implement. That's, that seems to make sense to me. I try to read on a daily basis. I try to exercise regularly. I try to pick up habits that work in balancing areas of my life, like recreation, as well as family time. But this story, what we have before us today, runs counter to the premise of the early bird getting the worm. Remember, this is the Jesus you never knew. Now, if you look at this, the early bird doesn't get the worm in this story. The early bird gets the proverbial shaft. Why do I say that? Because if we read through this, we think about a full work day. And a full work day would be eight hours for most of us, 10 hours, maybe 12. We don't know exactly how long the work day is here, but we know that it's far longer than eight hours. And it was probably sun up to sundown or approximately within those ranges. Story tells us, the parable says, that Jesus says that the landowner owner of the vineyard goes out and hires the first people right away in the morning. The second group he hires at the third hour. The third group he hires at the sixth hour. The fourth group he hires at the ninth hour. And then the last group he hires at the eleventh hour. So we can assume that they've been working on a 12 to 14 hour work day. I don't know what that noise is either, guys. I see a bunch of you just going... Guessing there's birds nesting somewhere there shouldn't be or something. But we can assume, let's assume that they're working a 12-hour work day. The people that worked one hour got paid the exact same amount as the people that worked 12 hours. If you were hired at the beginning and you were promised an areas and you worked 12 hours, would you not be slightly disappointed at the least when you find out that everybody else gets paid the same as you? I can understand that frustration. That makes sense to me. When I read this story, when I hear this parable, it makes sense to me. It's like the, the ones who got li hired last are basically the favorite kids on Christmas morning. All right? You can tell when you open the gifts is who's the favorite. Read into that as you will. <laughs> These guys basically fast-passed it to the front of the line. That's what they did. Now understand that a denarius is a good wage. It's a normal day's wage. A denarius would be similar at the time to what a Roman soldier would make for a day's worth of pay. So it's not like they were getting shorted at all. 
They were making a decent day's wage. But if we, if we read through this, we could probably all agree that Jesus' example of this generosity is misplaced slightly, not even remotely close to what we would figure appropriate. I mean, does that sound right to you? To pay the same wage for all the workers? Now, if you're paying it on what you accomplish and somebody accomplishes in an hour what somebody else accomplishes in 12, I get that. I understand that. I wrap my mind around that. But if you're working 12 hours and you're working one and everybody gets the same, that's just not good business practices in my opinion. It's not good relational practices necessarily either. But verse 15 tells us that this wasn't a matter of justice on the part of Christ. It was a matter of generosity. What does the landowner say? Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? The generosity of Christ is what matters in our lives. Not necessarily the perceived inherent value of the worker. Without the generosity of Jesus, every single one of us is lost. Without the generosity of Jesus, there is no cross. We all fall short. And at that point, it doesn't matter how much time or how much effort or how much early bird getting the worm we invest, we all fall short without the generosity of Christ. And now, in my opinion, this is a very, when you look at it closely, a very powerful parable. And if you were to pick out a parable of Jesus that he spoke in somewhere in the Gospels that really hits home with you, what would your parable be? I'll be honest, this would not be it for me. If I were to pick out a parable that really hits home with me, it would be something like the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. That one hits home with me. Like that one, man, it brings me to tears just thinking about it. Or, or along the same lines, the parable of the lost sheep. Right, where the shepherd's out and he's got the 99, but he still goes to look for the one. And they're very similarly intertwined. Those really hit home with me. They speak to my heart. They speak to my soul. I really like the parable of the mustard seed and the yeast, right? The smallest of seeds grows into a tree where birds can, branch it or can, can nest in its branches and get shade by it. Or the yeast working through the whole batch of dough, and that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. I like those. I would not come anywhere near... The parable of the workers in the vineyard is one of my top parables. It doesn't, if I wasn't preaching on it this morning, I was as powerful as I think it is, it wouldn't even come into play. I wouldn't think about it. Here's the thing. Sometimes it's easy to read through a parable of Christ or a certain section of the Bible and just be completely unchanged by it. You're like, okay, whatever, I'm moving on to the next one. And I honestly believe that's kind of what the parable of the vineyard workers is. It's easy to read over it. It's easy to gloss over it. It's easy to look at it and just go, okay, well, come next to Jesus predicting his own death and then a mother's request. I've done this before and I've done this with this passage. You know why I've done this with this passage, if I'm just being honest with you? It's because I don't necessarily agree with it. I don't necessarily agree with what Jesus is saying. I mean, did Jesus really mean what he spoke in this parable? Did he really mean what he said here? Because again, I think we can all agree that it's not fair. In my uh, estimation, in my sense of justice, in my sense of generosity, it doesn't make sense to me. A worker that works one hour gets paid literally the same as a worker that works 12 hours. But Pastor Scott, Let's take this and go right from the beginning. Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is not a literal example. Jesus is saying, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. And he gives a living example of this when he's hanging on the cross, right? When he's hanging on the cross and the criminal who's crucified beside him says, remember me when you get, you know, to your father's throne. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. That man was a criminal all his life. All he knew was bad behavior until he met Jesus. You don't get hung on a cross for minor things. Right? This was not a good apple that got hosed in this court system or something along those lines, quite like Jesus did. He deserved to be up there. He deserved to be hung and crucified on a cross. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. This man lived at what? A couple hours at the most. 
sure about his eternal salvation. His disciples had followed him for years. The religious leaders and the Pharisees had followed God for years. And yet Jesus grants clemency to this criminal? That's how he brings this story to life. Right? It's not about a day's wage. It's about the kingdom of God. But here's the thing I struggle with. If I can't wrap my mind around the simple concept of a day's wage, how can I wrap my mind around it being seen in the kingdom of God? If I'm being honest, don't I carry around this sense of inherent and internal fairness and unfairness within me? Of who deserves what based on attitudes and actions and behavior? Of who I like and I don't like? Of who I get along with and I don't get along with? Of who I know their past and I don't know what they've done? If I'm being honest, I don't think I'm the only one who does that. That's why I struggle with this parable. Because if you say you love God, that according to what Jesus says here in other places, you must love people. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. First and greatest commandment. The second is just like it. What? Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophet hangs on these two commands, Jesus says. And it's easy to do that around people that you like, isn't it? But what about when it's not? What about when it's not? What is it about people who test you, who you don't care for, or it's an oil and water type of relationship? What does it look like to live your life as though the last will be first? It's kind of hard to define, but I think we know it when we see it, don't we? When you live your life according to the standard that Jesus set here, you don't just live your life for yourself. You live life for others, for your neighbor. I have a good friend of mine, one of the most generous people I know, literally. One of the most generous people I know. Grew up in a godly home, raised his children in a godly home. Oldest son is in his mid-30s. As far away from God as you can possibly imagine. And I mean it. As, poss- as you can possibly imagine, imagine it. That's where his son at, is at in relationship with Christ. This man prays for his son every day. Every day for 30 years. Shows him nothing but love. Treats him with respect every time he sees him. And I guarantee every night when this man goes to bed, his heart is broken over his son. But he's living it, isn't he? You know another good example? My wife. I'm sure she hates that I'm pointing her out right now. Guys, you know it as well as I do. I could leave this church today, and you would function fine next week. If she leaves, we're hosed. (laughs) You know it, right? She would bend over backward to do anything for any of you so that you don't have to be made uncomfortable. She's got a servant's heart. And I know she's humiliated by me saying this right now, but it's a great example of this passage. And and, and I could go on. We could spend literally hours in here, and I could go around and point and talk about almost everyone in here. And those of you I couldn't, it's because I don't have a relationship with you. And talk about the ways that I've seen Christ in you, an example of this. Man, all you had to do was show up for VBS this week. Guys, here's what I don't get. I've never been into children's ministry. I've never been ashamed to say that. That's not my forte. Right? People actually show up for VBS smiling. I don't know how. I don't know why. Right? Della walks in with a big old smile on her face. Marilyn's happy to be up front. I'm going, what is wrong with you people? Right? I suffer through it. They love it. And those are just two examples. I could say that just about anybody here. I could say that about the church board who meets monthly to come out, out of their own time, who spends time doing stuff, not because I want them to, but because they care about this body. I could point out ministry leaders. I could point out so many unsung heroes in here and people that just do things behind the scenes. That's what this passage is about. And we know that we're not perfect, that nobody is perfect, and we don't expect you to be perfect. We readily admit that. And if I went around and talked about each one of you in front of everybody, let's be honest, you would be extremely uncomfortable. It's a little thing called humility, and that's a good thing that makes you that way. But isn't that what being last looks like? 
Isn't that exactly what it looks like? Putting others before yourself. Paul spoke this to Philippians, right? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. The author of Hebrews says, do not forget to do good and share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Paul wrote to the Romans, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, honor one another above yourselves. The Bible is flush with examples of people putting others before themselves. Some of them did it very begrudgingly. Jonah, right? Moses, Esther, Paul. We're not going to do it, but God kind of forced your hand. Some of them did it willingly. If you think about Abraham, if you think about Noah or Daniel or Peter or Mary, the mother of Christ, They did it willingly. They defined their lives by service to God through serving others. And it's the defining characteristic or mark of a follower of Christ as well. James chapter 1, verse 22. James hits his point home. Right? James 1, 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Right? I grew up in the 80s and 90s. There was this Christian rap hip-hop group called DC Talk back in the day. Right? And they sang this song, Love is a Verb, and that's what it means. And what was cool about the 90s was love was spelled L-U-V, because that's how we roll. But that's what it was, right? That's what James is saying here. You can't just say it. You have to do it. Religion, our God, our Father, accepts his pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself being by polluted by the world. Then he goes on this whole diatribe on chapter 2, and I have to read it. What good is it, brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? James says the two are intertwined. The two are intertwined. Can such a faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the throne, on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture is fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, not, was not even Rahab the prostitute. Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. The words of James, not the words of Pastor Scott. If we say that we are a Bible-believing church body, then we cannot separate out faith and action in our lives. They are intertwined with one another. Jesus himself gives this illustration, right? Matthew chapter 25. Talks about these two groups, the sheep and the goats. And they'll be separated At judgment, one on the right, one on the left. And one of them will be in heaven, and the other one will be not in heaven. And what's the qualification that Christ gives at the end of this parable about those who go in and those who do not? He says, whatever you did or did not do for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did or did not do for me. When we serve others, who are we serving? Christ. Whatever you did or did not do for one of the least of these, you did or did not do for me. Again, the words of Christ, not the words of Pastor Scott. The difference between the sheep and the goats was what they did, how they lived, action, serving. Living for others should be part of who we are at our core as a body of Christ. Let me be abundantly clear that there are levels of priority. You do not say, oh, sorry, family, I won't see you again for three months because I need to do this, or I'm eliminating you from my life because I have other things to do. 
Your family is an area of service. You tend to what God has placed before you. But if the last will be first and the first will be last, here's the question I want to raise. Why do we so continually race to be first in so many of the worldly markers and areas of our lives and of this church? Think about it. Can you imagine, can you imagine, this would be crazy, can you imagine if a group of Christians raced to serve others? Can you imagine what that would look like? The impact that would have not on our lives but on the lives of those? What if we lined up not to get but to give more? What if we had opportunities or, or contests to see who could outgive others? Wouldn't that be amazing? I'd be willing to bet that our lives and our churches would look a little different if we did. All right? If you remember, pre COVID, we had just started up a small group, DNA groups. One of the premise of the DNA groups is you met weekly or bi-weekly with your group and you talked about it. One of the things you had to do every, between all of your meetings is you had to bless somebody in this church. And then you had to bless somebody who is not a member or, a, or an attender of this church. Again, bless somebody inside the walls of this church, bless somebody outside the walls of this church. And then when you get together with your small group, you talk about it. It was one of the couple things. There was three things we had to do. That was one of them. And it could be a big blessing. It could be a small blessing. It could be, hey, send a text. Say, Man, I'm praying for you today. I love you, and I hope you have a great day. Or it could be, hey, I'm buying you a new truck or something like that. I'm not sure we did that or anything, but I'm saying you could if you really want to bless somebody and you had the funds to do that. That's weird, but that'd be cool. Um, boy, wouldn't it, that, Anyway, right? But you get together, and then you share about the ways that you've blessed people. You share with your group about the ways you bless people. And here's what we found in our DNA groups. When we blessed others, we were the ones who were, in fact, drawn closer to the Holy Spirit. It wasn't a, man, I, I sent this text today, and I, I wish something else would have happened. Or, man, I give somebody, a, you know, I bought the meal for the car behind me, and I feel terrible about it. You know, it, no, it was like, man, God really worked through this. And God worked in my heart. When I served others, God worked in my heart. Isn't that fascinating? When we bless others, we are drawn closer to Christ. So is it possible, just possible, that that's how we were designed to live by our creator? That we were designed to be a blessing to others in our lives? That we were designed to invest in others? Guys, it's not just a Christian concept. In 2017, Upworthy Magazine wrote this article about 10, about people that give to others and people, served, the people that serve others tend to be happier people. Here's what they said. According to the paradox of generosity, Americans who describe themselves as very happy volunteer an average of 5.8 hours per month. Those who donate more than 10% of their incomes also exhibited lower depression rates than those who did not. In a study, a 2016 study at the University of Utah totally backs up everything here. Listen to, the way, listen, to what they, listen to the conclusion that they came to. One of the best ways to achieve greater happiness, research is beginning to show, is to be of service to others. If you want to be happier in your lives, serve others, University of Utah found. We all know it feels good to do something nice for someone else, holding a door, letting someone go ahead of you in a grocery line, spending the evening in the soup kitchen are all valuable for the spirit. However, good deeds may do, may do more than give you a temporary boost for a day. People who routinely do them may actually be happier and have a higher quality of life than those who do not. This is probably not a surprise to you. Service to fellow men and women has been a prime tenet of a life well lived since the ancient times. But our no-holds-barred, every-man-for-himself world, it's sometimes easy to forget the case and look elsewhere for elusive contentment. Gallup poll data, they say, is very clear. People who regularly provide service to their communities have higher levels of well-being hands down. The wellness scores of people who receive community rec recognition averages 70, while those who have not averages 58.5. The disparity holds true in every age segment and for every household income bracket. Doesn't matter how rich or poor you are. 
then it finishes up by saying this. Well, wealthy, wealthier Americans typically have higher well-being than lower income counterparts, Gallup explains. Lower income Americans who have received rec recognition for community work have a higher average index score than even the highest income earners who have not received community recognition. 67.2 versus 62.6. It's hard to argue with the data. Service and happiness are irrevocably and powerfully linked. Science tells us that you are happier when you give, that you are happier when you serve others. Isn't that something? Coincidence? I don't think so. I believe it's the way our Creator wired us to live, I just believe it's the way we were designed. And when we live in service to others, let me say it again, we live in service to Christ. You want to draw close to Christ? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Serve others. Love God. Love people. In that way, you are drawn into relationship and faith in Christ. As the body without the spirit is dead, so is faith without deeds, James says. And when we serve others it allows us to get a better window into seeing how Christ served us. You know why I say that? It's because, this may scare you a little bit, I believe many of you are like me. I believe many of you are like me in the fact that when you read through this parable, who do you see yourself as? The first worker, right? The reason I don't like this parable is because I'm the one who's been out working for 12 or 14 hours. That's why I don't like this parable. When in reality, who do I more closely resemble? The one hired at the 12th hour. When I see myself as a worker hired at the first hour, I see myself through my eyes, through my inherent value, through what good Scott brings to the table, not through the eyes of Christ. When Christ has said, I've been generous to you so that you can be generous to others, that's the way I need to see myself. Not through, well, I've been out here for 12 hours and I'm just getting the same stinking denarius that I was promised, even though these are guys are getting it too. We tend to see ourselves differently than Christ sees us. Paul says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, not some. All of us. But then he follows it up by saying, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. We've been given an incredibly generous gift. No matter what social stratus or financial stratus or level that you are at, it does not matter all of us have been given an incredibly generous gift from Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, so that we can pour that gift into others, so that we can love God and we can love others. Amy Carmichael sums it up well. She says, you can always give without loving, but you can never love without giving. Think about it. May our life and our actions, both individually and collectively, reflect the generosity of Christ dispelled unto our lives. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, when we consider your word, may we be challenged. Not because of who we are, but because of who you are. Because of your love. The, the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, that we just can't even wrap our minds around. It's too much for us to fathom. And it's far more than we deserve. And God, I pray that you would give us inspiration and opportunity and passion in our lives. Then we see moments or instances of service that we can open our hearts with a generous attitude because of your spirit alive and at work within us, understanding that we have received generously so that we can give generously. And whatever that means, whether it be a word of encouragement or a dollar to somebody who needs it, Father, may our hearts be broken before you to see those opportunities and to live passionate lives that fulfill them so that the world is changed through your son. We want the world to hear about you. We want the world to know you. So work in us to that end. Keep our selfish agenda, keep all of our stuff to the side that you may be glorified. And when others see us, may they see you. And where they don't see us, help us to speak your name unashamedly in all that we say, in all that we do, and in all that we are for your kingdom purposes. We ask these things in the generous name of your son, Jesus.